UCLA, where uh, he was the George F. Miller Professor of Anthropology and Education, and also uh, Professor of Applied Linguistics. Uh, and I think that, that title shows you exactly what kind of uh, Renaissance man Fred really is, and that's something I've always appreciated about his work and mentorship. Uh, very few people that we work with have uh, studied music and music history and ethnomusicology and then have also worked in science education and education and, and policy and uh, across all these lines in, in really provocative and interesting ways. Um, and I don't mind saying, I don't know if I ever said this to Fred, but his, his book, Talking Social Theory, is the, the first time I ever thought I understood Foucault and or do, and so, uh, which speaks to how he can take these really complicated, rich things and, and make them beautiful and, and coherent. Uh, and, and so I'm really, really excited to see what he has to say. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to share very briefly is that I had the incredible fortune, good fortune to work with Fred at UCLA and to work at the laboratory school and on this project that he's going to be sharing. Um, and while Fred's probably too modest to talk about some of the details, what always struck me about that experience was how uh, Fred as a researcher and, and director of research at the lab school was uh, deeply enmeshed in the community as a member who really just engaged and, and lived with the teachers with whom he was working. Uh, all too often we see boundaries between teachers and researchers and particularly in a political environment on a college campus uh, and I never saw, maybe there are stories, but I never saw any of that and, and what I saw was that uh, teachers and teacher educators uh, who did not have PhDs but were really passionate about research and using their language to convey research were excited to do that with Fred and were excited to work on this project which was truly, truly a collaboration with all those voices present. Uh, so you can take my word for it that there, there was passionate and engaged and, and sometimes uh, passionate in not a good way, but, but we all made friends afterwards, uh, <laughs> debates with all these teachers and, and stakeholders, and so uh, the, I'm really excited that you'll get to see the final product all these years later, but uh, it was a wonderful place to be at the time. So with, with no further ado, uh, mm -hmm. please join me in welcoming Fredericks. Well, thank you, Josh, <coughs> and, and uh, we're going to see a little bit of video footage that he shot, uh, um, as well as um, some other uh, video clips in this website. Uh, the reason that I, um, that I wanted to share this with you is I, I think the website itself is kind of intrinsically interesting because it shows the teaching of physics with very young children. That's still pretty unusual. Um, when I went to UCLA in 1999, I was introduced to some teachers at the lab school uh, who were uh, in kindergarten first grade classrooms and they had developed some ways of teaching science. Life science one year and physics uh, in alternate years, uh, it, they were teaching real science with little kids um, in what I thought were interesting ways. And I was looking for some teachers who wanted to work with uh, me uh, in figuring out ways of showing other teachers um, complex teaching practice. Okay? So, and, and I was recommended to these people by, by the principal of the school, uh, who I had a lot of respect for. She said, they're doing the most interesting teaching, I think, at the moment in the lab school. And, and uh, we, we talked about this and decided that the following year, which would be the physics year again, we would uh, monitor um, the, uh, the, the teaching of physics thematically across the whole course of the year uh, with the teachers. We would videotape at their direction uh, and uh, uh, they would then be involved in putting together what at the time we weren't sure whether it was going to be CD-ROMs or whether it was going to be a website. Eventually it ended up that we got an NSF grant to 
uh, produce a website, and that's what you're going to see. Um, but at any rate, we, um, uh, we set out uh, with the intention of the teachers themselves uh, being very actively involved in showing other teachers how they did what they did, and particularly showing backstage aspects of teaching. One of the things that had concerned us, um, it had concerned me just generally in educational research on teaching, uh, is you know sort of the easiest thing to do to show teaching uh, is either narratively or with a video camera to show um, the teacher at the front of the room doing something, you know. And, uh, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of what it takes uh, to actually live with kids <coughs> across the course of a year and live with subject matter and, and plan and have resources available and think about how you're using space for instruction and, you know, all kinds of things that, that you don't necessarily see just walking into the classroom. And in fact, the people at the lab school at UCLA um, already had a feeling for that. This is a, uh, I'll just give you a little more orientation um, uh, on the school itself. It's, um, uh, it was constituted by an act of the California legislature in 1882 as a demonstration school so-called, uh, when they opened up the southern branch of the normal school, which uh, was in uh, uh, the Bay Area, uh, the original normal school for teacher training, uh, they opened uh, one in Los Angeles and thought there should be a demonstration school along with it. So, so it, it's been a place that was there for people to visit ever since. Uh, but, but at the time I got there, 1999, uh, faculty were, were very much aware that some of their visitors didn't seem to know what to look for as they walked in and out of classrooms. It wasn't just being there face to face. wasn't. Uh, wasn't meaning that people were necessarily noticing things that were important about the pedagogy and curriculum. And so we had a feel that one of the things we wanted to do with what eventually became the website was, a, was an attempt to try to teach people to look and listen for the right things that could be seen and then also fill in some of the backstage life that, uh, that you wouldn't even see as an ordinary uh, visitor. Um, so that was the spirit behind it. Just parenthetically, 1882 is a good 10 years or 14 years maybe uh, before John Dewey started the famous lab school at the University of Chicago. Uh, Bank Streets, uh, Bank Street College of Education Lab School, another famous school, didn't begin until the teens of the 20th century. So the UCLA Demonstration School was one of the oldest uh, of the lab schools. You had them here, um, you had them at, uh, at, at Ohio State, uh, most of the Big Ten universities had lab schools. They're almost all gone for partly political reasons, partly financial reasons. At any rate, um, at any rate, uh, this is a place where faculty expected people to come and visit and to wonder about the how of their practice. And we wanted to try to build a website that would show that. Uh, that turns out to be really difficult. <laughs> um, uh, another of the fallacies, kind of, at this time, uh, the late 90s, 
was that libraries of videotapes of teaching practice would sort of solve the problem of making teaching practice visible. I mean, there was a recognition, especially uh, with some of the National Science Foundation um, supported uh, curriculum development and pedagogical development in science and math, STEM uh, <coughs> teaching, that, uh, you know, teaching mathematics for understanding, uh, teaching science uh, in ways that weren't you know, just for little kids taking a, a, a bottle of vinegar and a box of bicarbonate of soda and pouring the vinegar in and having this thing that looks like a volcano <laughs> come out and calling that teaching science. Uh, um, to, to, to go beyond that, uh, teachers had to do things that other teachers hadn't themselves experienced as students, right? When Maggie Lampert, who was a former student of mine, uh, started teaching uh, mathematics for understanding uh, at Michigan State, uh, you know, uh, none of the kids had experienced that as fifth graders. Uh, the teacher education students that she was working with hadn't seen somebody like that before. Any, anyway, so there, there was this, for a while, there was this idea that if we just had libraries of videotapes, people could go and look at them and then they'd understand what new practices were and could adopt them or adapt them for themselves. Uh, by the time we started this project, uh, I think some of us realized that was naive. And part of the problem was that minimally edited video footage, which was what we were doing and what other people had done, where you hold the camera pretty much steady, you do long takes, uh, you're trying not to develop um, video that will be then cut and spliced in short pieces to make a narrative documentary film that tells a story kind of and tells it relentlessly as a kind of a closed text uh, this more minimally edited footage while it has the advantage of, of, of kind of monitoring what's going on uh, is not something that that people know how to watch because we're so socialized by our experience with cinema uh, and television uh, in narrative genres uh, that when we don't have that kind of heavy editing to guide us, we don't know what to look for. And particularly classroom shots of a whole classroom where there's a bunch of people doing different kinds of things uh, and you don't know what all the artifacts are and what the, why things are there and uh, so on. Uh, the footage ends up sometimes being viewed by people uh, as if it was a projective test. You know, you can sort of read into it uh, almost anything you want based on your prior experience, your own what I had <coughs> come to call pedagogical commitments as a teacher. I tried to study earlier in my career what teachers looked and listened to in the real time of teaching, early grades teaching. And I found that what they attended to was very deeply a matter of their pedagogical commitment, what they thought was important as a teacher. So, so minimally edited footage invites that kind of projection by viewers. And, and so on the one hand, we wanted to take advantage of the, the openness of the website as a genre. You can navigate around the website in nonlinear ways that reading uh, uh, an ethnographic monograph uh, as a closed text or watching a documentary film that's heavily edited doesn't, doesn't allow for your 
moving around yourself uh, as a visitor to a website. But if you're going to be more than just a tourist, uh, then you need some kinds of scaffolding. And you also need, uh, we thought, some ways of building a website that would teach you how to look at it as you looked at it. And so that's what we tried to do. And, 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 and I'm, so what I'm going to do now is show you some of the website with these two things in mind. It's a website that invites navigation, but also guides it in some ways. And it invites looking at videotapes and reading text that accompanies it, much of which was written by the teachers. Uh, but but the, uh, the, the accompaniments to the video, we hoped, also scaffold uh, to prevent <coughs> just a kind of simple projection viewing, uh, projecting your own opinions uh, about what good practice looks like, what learning looks like. And, and um, uh, so anyway, so, so one emphasis is on how the website tries to teach you how to use it as you use it. And then the other aspect is the pedagogy and curriculum itself. This is, I think, kind of intrinsically interesting stuff because we're teaching, they were teaching the, the physics of matter, energy, and motion when, with kindergarten first graders, five and six year olds, and uh, in, trying to have it be real physics, not just you know, the bicarbonate of soda and, and uh, 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 vinegar bottle. Um, so what we literally spent years thinking about how we might organize uh, the presentation in the website of this teaching approach. And we came up with, with uh, five different components or uh, aspects, I don't <coughs> want to call them dimensions quite, but aspects of the teaching practice. Uh, and they involved planning, it's very important, uh, the classroom setup, it, the way space is organized, the resources are, are provided, and so on. What we call classroom culture, relationships uh, between students and students and teachers and students, student learning experiences, first hand, second hand, and third hand experiences, and <coughs> students' representations of their understanding uh, as their understanding evolved as a result of the learning experience, engagement in the learning experience. So um, those, that's the way we sliced this multi-dimensional uh, space of teaching practice. And then uh, what happens in the website is that there's a video example for each of the, uh, uh, under each of the heads. So there's one for formal planning, one for flexible planning, one for planning of projects. Um, and so on, um, and um, I'll, I'll be showing you some of this um, in a minute. Um, but it took us a long time to kind of think through even this, and, and we had arguments about what words to use. The teachers didn't want the word activities to appear in this, uh, in this website. Because they said, you know, activities have become, you know, trivialize what 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 we're doing. That, that that's what teachers share in these make and take workshops, and and uh, and we think most of those are gimmicks. What we're trying to do is much more integrated, much more fundamental, and so we don't want to. We don't even want to use that word. And and there are some other. Uh, uh, word choices like that that we argued about. Um, uh, 
and always with this idea that that um, you have a you have a visitor to this thing who can navigate uh, and look at whatever aspects of this they want to in whatever order, and and yet we wanted to provide some kind of scaffolding for that visit. By the way, just to reiterate, you, you, uh, you didn't see this, I guess. We set this up before. If you want to look at this later, and I hope you will, and if you do, and if you send me feedback, I'd love it. I, I really, we're still working on this. Um, this is called the Classroom Ecosystem Explorer. That's what the acronym is. Classroom Ecosystem Explorer. It's an ecosystem, and you as a visitor are an explorer, and we want you to sort of move from just being a tourist to being a real explorer in some depth with, with this thing. Um, uh, and then, of course, the other big idea uh, is it's an ecosystem. So everything connects with everything else. As you plan, your planning setup, your planning aspects of people's relationships with each other, uh, your planning learning experiences, your planning uh, how children will represent their growing understandings of key ideas. Uh, and uh, so uh, everything connects with everything else uh, in this ecosystem. Uh, and we tried to build the website to underline that notion too. Um, so let's um, let's look first at uh, um, um, setup. There were there, we found some little quotes uh, for each of the, each of the heads. The quotes themselves aren't that important, but it's a little introduction to things. Uh, if you want more of it, uh, you can find. Um, I don't know. Maybe there isn't any more for that one. Sometimes more gets you more. In this case, maybe. Uh, no, it's not. Can you? Might have oh, shut down. What? Oh, there. Oh, okay. I was pressing for me. No other to show you. Okay. So we have uh, um, aspects of the setup of the classroom that happen at the beginning of the year before anybody is there. And uh, for each of these, there's a definition with some discussion of benefits uh, and examples. Um, uh, and then there's a video. And I think this was one of the ones that Josh shot uh, in, in another of the classrooms. You click on the video and we get a... Um, where's the sound? We need more sound, Josh, uh, or somebody. Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. say, well, no big deal, but in fact, the way function areas are organized in these classrooms is very important, and then the materials that go with them as resources, um, and 
the different kinds of activities that they afford um, uh, as uh, learning experience sites uh, is, is a very important part of this pedagogy, and we wanted people not to take that for granted. Um, uh, and then there's something else that, uh, that goes with it, which is uh, that uh, when you watch the video the first time, this is the most uh, kind of uh, original thing, I think, in the, in the website. Um, we've provided multiple viewings uh, with a little bit of scaffolding for each of the video clips. And so the second time around of, in any of these, you get to watch the video with stop buttons. Um, a very simple thing, but a, a, a little pop-up uh, uh, text comes up that uh, says, look, the cabinets and bookcases aren't just haphazardly arranged here. There's a, there's an underlying order here, and, and part of part of uh, uh, the the success of this ecosystem is how you how you do that. And then, of course, uh, well, anyway. So, and then you can click, and it shows you some more. And uh, we'll go ahead to another one. Uh, okay, and that student work. Uh, it's a divider between activity areas, but it's also an opportunity to display student work. And you, as the camera panned around, you probably didn't think about that as you were watching it. There's so much information there uh, that, that you need a little bit of guidance to know how to look at the, how this place is organized. Okay. Now, but it doesn't stop there <laughs> because there are planning aspects to how this organization of space got developed and how it changes across the year. And the space uh, provides places, as I said, for students to have learning experiences. And so one of the things we realized as we were building the website was that every video, uh, while while this is this is a this is an example of of, of space, um, every video, especially the live ones where you see live action, uh, show some aspects of all the other components in the in the ecosystem. So there are planning aspects, there's culture aspects, experiences, and representation potentially in every video clip. So we have multiple stop buttons. And we get that. Uh, oh, this is, this is another little thing. When, when, um, whenever you want in the, uh, the video, uh, you can stop it. You can hit this little button and it shows you um, a discussion of, of what the content is. Um, but uh, now we can go to um, uh, we can go to look again at um, the um, sorry um, now we get a now we get a button that gives us another set of stop buttons for planning. Uh, let's just see what this one is. Okay. So this tells you about the planning rationale behind the use of space. And uh, as we go ahead, we'll just go ahead to this. I don't know what this one's going to be. Okay. So, a little more about that and, and so on. So, and we could do, we won't, but we could do experiences, we could do 
uh, affordances for student-student relationships, teacher-student relationships. Um, every video clip has stop buttons for all the different aspects of the practice so that as you revisit them you can think about the different things that are available to see in that clip and we hope that that does two things for the visitor. First it invites them to revisit the clips and not just watch them once, right, so that they begin to get into more depth into the information that's there in the clip. And secondly, uh, it invites them to think uh, about different aspects, right? The, and, and again, reinforcing this notion that this is an ecosystem. All the different aspects or components of the practice <coughs> relate to each other. And if you change something in your arrangement of space, or you change something in the resources and the way you've organized those, it's going to change learning experiences for kids. I mean, one of, the, one of the problems with the adoption of complex teaching practice is that because all these things relate to each other, continually, uh, you have these kind of um, uh, problems of, of the, uh, uh, the sorcerer's apprentice who's trying to adopt the new practice but doesn't quite understand how it all hangs together and so, you know, you, you, you change something in, in one aspect and you don't change other things and then you get these, these aspects of the classroom life that are working at cross purposes, right? Uh, so we're, we're trying to invite uh, a, a more ecological and, and uh, more deeply reflective kind of thinking about all that. And the stop buttons are, are part of that architecture <coughs> for, for the website. Okay, now let's look at some things that are just kind of intrinsically interesting. Um, um, the, uh, we'll start with, no, we'll start with um, representation. At the very beginning of the year, um, also here, in, in here somewhere, I won't go into this, uh, is a kind of a calendar that shows the evolution of topics across the entire year. It was taught thematically and it started by looking at matter and different characteristics of matter and then they move on to energy and then energy and motion. And at the end of the year, the energy and motion theme gets captured by a classroom project, which is the creation of a roller coaster, a classroom-sized uh, roller coaster that through which you can send messages back and forth between the two adjoining classrooms. The two teachers were working on this together. And, and, that, and, and that illustrates the distinction between kinetic and potential energy. Right? That's how a roller coaster works. Right. So they're building toward this stuff about kinetic and potential energy. But at the beginning of the year we start with matter, and matter in different states and different characteristics of matter. Matter can be smooth, matter can be rough, matter can be um, all kinds of things. And here's a video that shows uh, something about Make your body a rough piece of wood. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are words. And I want to see how you make those words with your body. And that's going to be kind of tough. So, let's find a place on the ground again. Let's see what we can do with our body. But how about if I do this? Yeah. 
I can be bumpy. What else? Uh, I can be yeah. rough. What else can I be? A stick. A stick is very what? Yeah. Rough and oh. pointy. Pointy. Drew, thank you. That's exactly what I wanted. standards at that time and that goes on and on, right? So, so if you at any moment want to see something about color. Now I want you to make yourself a very pointy pencil. And a pointy, pointy, pointy. Oh my goodness, Raymond's got his hands all the way up. So does Emma. Some of you are lying down and pointing out. This is great. Point, point, point. Excellent job. Okay, so that's uh, kinesthetic representation. It's both a learning experience, but it's also a representation uh, of, of understanding. And then there's uh, two-dimensional representation, uh, drawing, um, uh, and uh, uh, oral textual, talking, writing uh, about things. Uh, under learning experiences, there are first-hand ones and second-hand and third-hand. I'm going to show you a first-hand uh, one uh, that's later in the year. We've gotten to energy, uh, past matter, and uh, a big idea is that simple machines make work easier. And this was uh, footage that Josh shot. Um, in um, Doris's classroom, uh, uh, actually a couple years after this, um, the, the, origin, the, the, the rough piece of wood clip, but it, it's the same um, curriculum again, it's, it's a new iteration of the teaching of physics. And um, this is a first-hand experience that, that uh, uh, illustrates um, how um, uh, simple machines make work easier. So. Okay, so they're trying to hammer a nail into a block of wood without a hammer. They don't have the simple machine. We have to put it all the way in this baby. In this baby, we have to put it all the way in. Let's not get it in. Yay! 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 Now we get the simple machine. Which one made your work easier? Uh, Which one, where did you use less energy? Okay, okay so 
you might be wondering um, uh, some questions uh, might come up as you watch the video, and there's a there's a frequently a answered questions button up here that gives us various things. Uh, should I have a first-hand experience for every concept, um, what not. Uh, there's also a question you can imagine uh, that comes, comes up um, with um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the whole business about the kids going and picking up the tools that are lying on the floor. And somebody says, my God, you know, um, this is a stereotype, but my God, inner city classroom, you know, you're going to have hammers and saws and, and screwdrivers and whatnot lying on the floor and, and you know, what will happen if you do that? And, and there's, there's, through the stop buttons and some other things, this thing gets you if you have that question, and you and you, and you follow through to it. Um, you get some stuff about how you know we can build classroom cultures in which kids are trustable, but that doesn't happen just by accident. And so you have to be you have to be working on all of that as well as thinking about how you communicate to a kid the idea that simple machines make work easier. And, and again, everything fits with everything else in this ecosystem. And, and yes, you can have a classroom like this, uh, and we've since this approach has been exported all over classrooms in the Los Angeles area. And yes, indeed, in inner city classrooms, kids can be just as responsible as any place else. Right? Um, but you don't want to just walk into that naively, especially if kids haven't had experience with choosing uh, tools for themselves and using them, and so on. So, so anyway, try to try to again unpack some of the things that aren't just obviously visible, and. Um, Let's just see what the stop buttons say. I have to take it to... Okay, so now this is explaining the, the task. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to to just a couple more clips um, and conclude. So we have a little time for for discussion. But I want to take you um, farther into the year after the idea of simple machines make work easier, uh, and uh, and then uh, the project of the roller coaster, the culminating project. Roller coaster as making work easier, sending messages back and forth. That's a little stretch, but that's the project for that year. And and so they worked on 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 this distinction between kinetic and potential energy because that's what makes a roller coaster work. And there are ways you can have firsthand experience of the difference between kinetic and potential energy. One is to swing on a swing. So the kids go out to the playground and they swing on the swing and they talk about it. And they come back and they draw. Uh, they draw analytic diagrams with arrows that show what happens with that pendulum effect. And because this is a university lab school, they were also able to go uh, on a field trip to a real roller coaster. Uh, they went to Legoland, which is one of the amusement parks in, in the L.A. metropolitan area, and they rode a roller coaster. And they came back and they wrote about how it feels to be on the roller coaster, and they drew beautiful, beautiful drawings of, of the roller coaster. I've got, got that on my 
my computer, I, I would have shown you a little of the artwork. It's just some of the artwork is wonderful. But, you know. uh, at any rate, uh, there are lots of different, and you can read about roller coasters, and then you can build one, which is what they do. And they, uh, so they build this system of two connecting um, uh, roller coasters, and it's at the very end of the year, and um, the, um, uh, the, the, they're putting up uh, signs on the roller, oh, that's, sorry, that's, um, I don't want this one. Um, well, well, actually, let's watch just a little bit of this. I love this. <laughs> okay, catch it, Julian! Okay, what this illustrates about student-student relationships is these kids work continuously over like eight minutes without adult supervision, debugging the rolling of this ball through the, through the system. Um, and it shows that you can create a classroom in which kids will really work together and you don't have to have a teacher bugging them every minute about that. But then, then we come to the day before the parents are going to come to see this on the last day of school. And they're, they finished the roller coaster and they're putting signs, kinetic and potential, in both English and Spanish, at the places in the system where kinetic energy is maximized and potential energy is maximized. That's, that's what they're supposed to be doing. And Alex very forthrightly reveals a misunderstanding about this. He's not here. Alex, you gotta explain that. This is kinetic energy because potential is energy is energy that get, is gaining energy, and kinetic is in it is leaving energy. Why'd you choose to show it as it's going down? Because it's it's losing speed. It's losing speed. Okay. Even though it is gaining speed, it's Okay, another thing about teaching for understanding is that, that talking about your thinking is a lot more face-threatening than just holding up your hand and saying a right answer or hiding out while somebody else is saying what the right answer is. So, and we know that now, but you know, people getting into this for the first time may not realize that. You've got to make it safe for people to say what they're really thinking and not have either the teacher pick on that or other kids, right? And so there's a whole thing in here about how, how uh, you do that with some written commentary. But uh, what happens in this case is that, that Alex is very forthright in what he says, and it's a little bit wrong, and this is a classic misconception at the high school level with Newtonian dynamics, right? The co conflating velocity with energy, right? And, and, uh, and so they, they, they have a classroom meeting in, in one of the two classrooms uh, to talk about this. And, you know, that could be very threatening. Alex didn't get it right, right? But instead, you'll see there's a very different spirit in the way they talk about this. Um, it's, I, wish, I wish I could have used my own. <laughs> one of them said, uh, the other one said kinetic. So, Alex put the one that said potential energy right here. And he explained to me, why did you put it right here, Alex? Okay, that's confusing. Mom said, how could that happen? When it's going down, it's going faster. 
mixing up uh, velocity and energy. And um, the teachers realize that uh, uh, this is an opportunity for reteaching <laughs> right at the last minute. And it turns out this was just before lunch, the, the, the scene with Alex and, and the classroom discussion about it happened. And because this is a university lab school, uh, and one of the parents in the, uh, uh, in, in the classroom happens to be a professor of physics from this <laughs> that they've been working with. They call him, and he was in his office at lunchtime, and he said, why don't I come over and let's talk about it. So they come, and here's really backstage flexible planning, rethinking about what are we going to do to reteach. And, and he reviews the, the, the fundamental ideas with them, and then you'll see they take it from there. Um, and if they just left this at, at a point of confusion without dealing with it, you know, you could argue that this whole year's worth of work was slightly damaged, but uh, it's a last minute save. <laughs> Fast you go, the more kinetic energy is not. Yes. Fast you go, the more kinetic energy is not. Okay. But you never lost any of your energy. Okay. Fast you go, the more kinetic energy is not. Yes. You never lost any of your energy. You always have the same amount of energy. Yes. Right? It's just going to be one more time. That's what I'm trying to point out because in order to try to explain it to them, because they kept confusing energy with speed. And I, to try to explain it to them, I said, you know, that they were storing it up and then letting it out. We didn't talk about it. That, that, that change, that's just a change. I think there's a little, uh, how do I say this word, misconception. Okay, so the other teacher, Alejandra, um, whose classroom is right next door, um, she literally walks out of the little room where she was talking, they were talking with the physics professor, and she calls, it's after lunch, she calls the kids to the rug and she says, we need to talk about this. So she's going to do this little reteaching lesson on the misconception <coughs> about energy and the relationship between energy and speed. Uh, energy and speed are not the same thing. La energía y la velocidad no son lo mismo. And let's just talk about energy. Forget the speed right now, okay? When you are at the top of the mountain, at the top, you're standing at the top of the mountain, what kind of energy do you have? And that is when you have the most potential energy. When you get to the top. Okay, so we're gaining potential energy, potential energy, potential energy, max potential energy. And the moment it starts coming down, that energy becomes, it's, okay, so transforming, kinetic, kinetic, kinetic. When is kinetic energy at its max? You like, what? show me with your finger. Where? How do you know that? Speed? Are you losing? Speed? Forget speed. Don't talk speed. You are right. Right here is where you have maximum kinetic energy. But you stop. Do you stop? What happens? Show me with your finger what happens. Here you come. Show me. Give me your finger. Okay? Here you are. Here's the car. Gaining potential, 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 maximum potential. Kinetic, 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 maximum kinetic. What's happening as you make that turn? What kind of energy potential? Okay, so then one of the kids in the group says, is this a little bit like when we run up and down the hill? And there's this big hill on campus. And the teacher says, yes, I think, yeah, it is. Let's go to the hill. <laughs> so they walk out to the hill, and this is what happens. <laughs> I want to see potential energy 
being transformed to kinetic energy, being transformed to kinetic energy, right, to potential energy, back to kinetic energy, and I want to meet you here at the maximum point of kinetic energy. Okay. Can you hear And I want to hear the word. That's it. Doesn't get any better though. <laughs> so, what we tried to do was show the complexity of complex teaching practice and curriculum, to show that this is an ecosystem in which different aspects of the practice are always continuously influencing each other. So if you change something in one aspect, you need to think about <coughs> the changes that are necessary in the other aspects. And uh, you have to do a lot of planning, uh, and some of it's advanced. There's a lovely scene of a group of teachers doing advanced planning while they're eating lunch, and they're talking with their mouths full, and that's backstage life, too. Um, but uh, you, you, uh, uh, you need to plan, but you also need to be flexible. But being flexible isn't being wishy-washy. Uh, and so on. And there are learning experiences of different kinds that you can design so that kids revisit the same fundamental ideas over and over with different sensory experiences, different semiotic modalities for, for representing ideas, writing, talking, analytic diagramming, uh, counting things, frequency tables, and so on. And, and um, Anyway, uh, and, then, and then what we tried to do with, and, and you can never really, I mean, it still feels like we're just scratching the surface of, of the complexity of this, but we wanted to and develop a website whose use would invite kind of more and more reflective uh, awareness of what was there so that as you use it, you move from being a tourist in somebody else's classroom to being a genuine explorer. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the point. And this is very different from writing a book. Right? We, uh, I said to the, the, the communications director that worked with us on this uh, at the school, is, uh, Laura is still there, and she's wonderful at helping teachers write about their own practice. And I said one day, Laura, you know, if you and I just sat down for six months, I bet we could write a book, you know, and we'd, we'd have, it would be a whole lot simpler. Uh, <coughs> but it wouldn't have teachers' voice, it wouldn't have had their cooperation in directing which video types uh, were selected as to illustrate to other teachers how you do this. Uh, it would have been a very different kind of uh, uh, enterprise relationally and ethically as a research enterprise. Uh, and it would have been a very different kind of document. So there, there you are. We have some time, I think, for talk, and, and then maybe there's, is there pizza also? There should, there should be pizza um, at sometime getting near 12.30. Okay, great. So, we, so let's, uh, I mean, we could look at a little more of this, but I'd, I'd really love to have us talk for a while, and maybe we won't even go back to the, to the, the website. Yes. 
Uh, thanks for showing us the video. It's really, I think, important to see how it's organized and get that kind of rich example into the different aspects. And so I appreciate it. Thank you. And you might have said this at the beginning, but I'm interested in knowing um, how you, when you work with maybe pre-service teachers or other individuals, giving them a lens into the classroom, how you kind of combat the ideas that this is idiosyncratic to this context. So if I had kids that were at a university school, if I had kids that were gifted, if I had kids that, how do you kind of then address this tendency to, it's just that specific context? Yeah, well, there, there's a good deal of, I didn't take you through all the written text stuff, partly because it's a little hard to read on, on the screen, but but there's frequent, under frequently asked questions, yeah, yeah. there's a bunch on that. You know, I'm not in a lab school and, you know, and my principal isn't even crazy about this kind of stuff. You know, how do I think about this? And, and we tried to anticipate um, a, a good deal of that. Uh, it hasn't been used much in teacher education. I mean, any of you who wanted to could. Uh, and that's an obvious question that comes up. Well, this is a university lab school. Uh, a part of what it says in the website, uh, and this is just partly my commentary, uh, is that, um, first of all, the lab school is adequately resourced. And there are very good teachers, and they stay. And the families that them tend to stay. There's a sibling... Um, uh, admission policy that allows younger kids in the family to stay, uh, I mean, to keep the families over time. But it's admission by, by lottery. Uh, and we have, uh, this school has a, a, a range of, of family income that you would never see in a regular school. There are very rich kids in here. There was, you saw the child of a movie star, I won't tell you which one, uh, 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 in one of the clips. Uh, Steven Spielberg's kids went there. He was a major, he's a major donor to the school. Um, but also Gardner's children from the university are there on scholarship. And what they, they do now is they had, at this time, they had a $10,000 um, tuition, which was a lot cheaper than the private schools in, in the area at that time, but still, poor people can't do that. Uh, so the more wealthy families were invited to contribute more, and they did, and their scholarship money, so that the, 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 the income levels are U-shaped with some close to, not quite the federal poverty index, but very close to that level at the low income level, and then very, very wealthy kids on the other side of the U. And interestingly, right in the middle are median UCLA faculty salaries, <laughs> right in the middle. Um, so it isn't just, it, it isn't just uh, privileged kids. Uh, secondly, um, there are kids with uh, mild learning handicaps of various kinds on the autism spectrum and so on. Uh, they aren't able to take severely physically handicapped kids. They just don't have the facilities for that. But these are not all easy to teach kids. Right? Uh, so, and, and the website makes that point. But that is an that is an obvious. Well, I can't do this where I am because my kids are different. We try to address that. That's always one of the things that comes up, and I don't know that writing it into the website takes care of it. But we did think about it, and just showing a clip without thinking about it, you know, to people, instantly invites just that kind of stuff. Well, you know. We can't do this. Yeah.